Hello everyone. My name is Susana Pareto Swap. I'm founder and executive director of an all volunteer nonprofit called Vanguard Culture that works to advance San Diego's creative industry workforce. Vanguard Culture provides quality arts coverage of San Diego's arts and culture community, professional development for creatives, and unforgettable cultural events that bring diverse communities together and inspire creative collaboration across all industries. For more information about our programs, please visit vanguardculture.org. The Art Shop is Vanguard Culture's new initiative designed to support the region's visual arts community by highlighting artists whose work responds to the changes and challenges of our contemporary world. In our Art Shop talks, we like to pair artists with curators with whom they've worked with in the past. And since Julia and I have worked together in this capacity, today I will have the honor of interviewing this dynamic and very talented artist. This is the part where we usually share a bit about the curator, so I'll share a little bit about me. I'm a magna cum laude graduate from San Diego State University with a BA in Humanities and a minor in French. I studied art history at the Sorbonne in Paris and history of video art uh, from the University of the Louvre, also in Paris. Um, my career also includes theater uh, studies at the Royal National Theater in London, PR work for local city government, and I'm currently the executive director of Vanguard Culture, a nonprofit that works to advance our creative industries. I've curated over 80 exhibitions with the San Diego International Airport's Temporary Exhibitions Program, one of which was a beautiful multimedia exhibition of Julia San Roman's Cante Hondo series. I couldn't be more excited to have Julia here with us today for our art shop talk. Julia San Roman is a California artist born in Madrid, Spain. Although she concentrated her formal education on science, eventually moving to the United States to further her career and earning a PhD in biology. The influence of her childhood's exposure to art remained an integral part of her passion for life. And after receiving training in studio arts and art history at the college level, she was, has committed her life to painting. Regarding her new series, The Hours, she states, The Hours is my homage to all of our valuable foreign workers, whom I believe are the silent base of the American economy. They are the seeds, the fasteners, the wheels, the gears of our society, and by taking care of the basics, they nurture it. Some of these courageous and reliable workers accumulate sick hours for a lifetime, but frequently are not allowed by their superiors to take it, or they feel insecure about taking it. Thus, they continue working even when they are ill. This is my now, as I work part-time as a medical interpreter in the workers' compensation system. It is a reality that I was aware of, but now I come to face, I come face to face with this unfair situation on a daily basis. Julia San Roman, welcome to the art shop. Gracias. Thank you so much <clears throat> for hosting me. Um, I have people from Spain connected right now. Oh, so this is this is an international event. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you. And thank you and welcome. Bienvenidos todos. Uh, pueden preguntar en español también si quieren, and I'll try to do the translation if you want to uh, submit your questions in Spanish, that's fine too. Um, so first of all, how are you? Uh, I mean, tell us about your pandemic experience uh, as a person, as an artist. What is life like for you right now? Well, for me, um, it, it has actually prompted me to do my art uh, almost full time because I had to be confined. I did that for three months and I, that's when I started uh, working with fluid acrylics. So I learned a complete new technique. Mm -hmm. um, later on during the summer, I returned to do medical interpreting, but I'm mostly doing it through Zoom or uh, phone. And I can always stay in my studio and take breaks to uh, do my interpretation. So uh, it's, it's Unfortunately, it's a sad situation, but it's worked for the best because it brought me back to my art. Yeah, wow. I mean, we're, we're, we are lucky in some ways. And another benefit to this is being able to be even more connected to people from around the world that we've you know, um, been friends with for years. Yes, that, that is true, yes. Yeah. Um, so before we get in, in, into the hours, the actual series that uh, 
we are featuring, um, I wanted to give the audience a sense of the scope of your work and sort of the arc of how you got to where you are at this point. So if you'll join me on this little visual tour, Julia, I'm going to invite you to stop me and to speak out about any of the pieces that you see. Um, so we'll get started with your uh, brief um, series. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I knew you at this point. I think this is when you were, yeah, I did know you at this point. Um, so you've yes, got some figurative uh, abstraction here happening. Yes, I was working in parallel with the Cante Hondo series that were those birds in flight in, this, in the, um, uh, the brief series mm -hmm. around the time I met you. It, that was 10 years ago, actually. Tell me about the abstraction uh, component of your figurative pieces. Yes. Um, the figures, I was actually talking about how transient and brief we are in this life. I was personally starting to lose some relatives. So I was coming face to face with uh, people passing away. And so what I decided is to paint the figure um, to deconstruct it, to, to do, um, let's say, a mock of digitalization. I did it with my palette knife, uh, building layers mm -hmm. and doing those, let's say, cubistic imprints mm -hmm. that resemble pix pixelation. Yes. Um, and the pixelation means lack of resolve or uh, fading away, which is what I was trying to, to say conceptually. Hmm. you know, that we are transient and that we pass very fast. Yes, I think that definitely is evoked here. Um, this is the exhibition that you and I worked on together. It's Cantejondo. We did a beautiful exhibition at the airport authority. Uh, you were actually, I believe, the first uh, ex or first or second exhibition that we held in the new art gallery in uh, Terminal 2 East, Terminal 2 East. And um, what I loved about it is that we included a multimedia component. So there was a sound uh, component of the sound of fluttering, um, flapping. flapping wings, but it was actually more the cantejondo. So tell us about that. Um, I heard the airport was looking for uh, artists to present projects uh, that had uh, uh, some cultural input. Um, and I thought the Cante Hondo uh, was based on my love for flamenco music. And um, uh, it, it started as a synesthesia, which is when I hear flamenco hand clapping, uh, I envision uh, birds taking off and the movement of their wings, uh, wings make, makes a sound that is similar to the clapping. So I, I was trying to depict um, birds in flight in clouds. And I also thought it was very appropriate because it was an airport. Um, so I developed, uh, along with my husband who helped me, an audio installation that would uh, get activated when the, uh, when the travel, travelers uh, got into the, the, um, the exhibition area. And uh, this, the audio was a mix of flamenco hand clapping that I recorded with real artists that live here in San Diego. And I mixed that sound with uh, wings flapping, um, mm. and it was it, it, you. You made an incredible, incredible exhibition. The way you hung it was exquisite, and it became like a shrine, like a place where the travelers could go and sit down and just relax. Um, it, it was a phenomenal experience for me, and it stayed there for six months, actually. Yeah, it was a beautiful exhibition. One of my favorites, for sure. Um, so th this is a little bit more of the Cantejondo and then, so that was happening uh, concurrently with Brief. And then um, you moved on to, um, let's see, there's a couple, here here. these are just so gorgeous. Then you move into disassociation. So what was happening in your life at that point? How did this uh, inform these pieces, if you can well, share? Although I am very politically and socially inclined, um, my work is very uh, biographical. And at that point, my husband, when I was working on those beautiful paintings with clouds and color, my husband was diagnosed, diagnosed with colon cancer, uh, stage four. And uh, I could no longer paint that way. So I decided to dissociate the paint, the color, sorry, from the composition as along with the birds, because everything in my life felt 
dissociate, dissociated, you know, in shambles. And um, so I developed this new series that are, is more in blues or grays with the, the color at the bottom or on one side. Um, and I did that for three years. It was, um, I also depicted the light of hope every time my husband went through chemo uh, and was high in, uh, from lack of energy, I would envision these rays of light. Um, and I was hoping for, for him to recover. Um, along that, along that um, I was starting to hear uh, issues, social issues. Um, you know, we, our society, our American society was going towards where we are now. And I was, I was also starting to feel this need for a ray of hope, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, you've all, have you always been sort of very tapped into social justice issues? Is that something that's always been a part of you um, yes, in your career? Yes. What happened is my husband's disease was so strong that it, it took precedent over over everything. But yes, I have always been very uh, politically and socially conscious. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I believe art has to be beautiful, visual art, but it also needs to have some, um, it, you know, uh, some concept behind what we do. That's yeah. my opinion. Not to, I understand some artists, they just want to do beautiful things, paint beautiful things and live, make a good living out of it. I respect that tremendously. But mm -hmm. in, my, in my case, I want my art to be meaningful or yeah. speak of issues. That's definitely the type of art that moves me. And in fact, I, I actually prefer art that makes me feel a little uncomfortable. Um, you know, I, I like art that challenges me and makes me give some pause and take a pause and, and analyze myself or humanity or all of it <laughs> or um, or makes me wonder, you know, makes me wonder either about the process, either about the the you know potentially like a double entendre that's happening or a subtext um so i think your work does that a lot for me i'm a huge fan and i i wanted to share because you know of course since i own a piece i wanted to share this piece um which i absolutely love and we have it here in our home so um that was a gift uh that uh, you offered to us thank you so much um and so we're going to move on to this next phase which is full circle and now all of a sudden we're seeing all of this color and this sort of chromatic dis, uh, deconstruction so what was happening here this is this is completely different from where you started what I did before well when i was in dissociation i painted gray for three years and uh, there was a time my husband kept alive for four more years and they're going chemo but there was this last spring before before he passed away that I needed some color in my life and I could only get it by painting it. Um, so I started painting the light of hope that I did in dissociation, but I, I started uh, painting it uh, as its spectrum, you know, the rainbow. The rainbow is the spectrum of light. And I did a series called Glimmer. Um, and then um, that whole series is still going on because it's very universal. And then uh, my husband passed away um, and a few years, a couple of years down the road, I felt uh, after I, I was going through grief, but when I overcame my grief, I felt like a little kid again, like I was um, 17 again. Uh, I also participated in a group show with my, my colleagues from uh, TWA, which is 12, uh, um, uh, women artists, and they actually had a show based on how we felt when we were 17. So I developed this, ser this series with the figure, uh, this is Glimmer that you are seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Glimmer is when I started deconstructing the light or um, uh, painting the light spectrum. I still have the clouds because I like to communicate or connect. These are This is vocabulary that I use that is part of my language, you know, and I, no. I appropriate those those uh, visuals like uh, th like they are my language, right? Yeah. And um, so full circle is um, bigger, let's say it's um, a continuation of my work with the figure in parallel with glimmer. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I added the light. Uh, full full circle also has to do 
with uh, Latin American salsa. Uh, part of the way I overcame my grief was by dancing salsa. Uh, I also integrated myself more by doing that with the Latino community. This is before I started um, by the way, I am Latina, but I am Mediterranean. I'm not Southern, uh, South American. So I'm Latina, but I, I also call, call them the Latino community. And they really cheered me up with their um, uh, spontaneity and the love for life and the way they dance. Um, and uh, so Full Circle has to do with me going back to when I was 17 and my love for Latin American music and dancing. And, and it still has the hope. Uh, for me, which is those lines of colors. This is Glimmer, which I'm still working on it. I'm going to have a show in downtown San Diego this spring with Glimmer. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's at Sparks Gallery? At Sparks Gallery, okay. yes. Check them out. This is yes. my favorite. It'll be there like for this. two and a half months, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. It'll be a solo show. Great. So now we're moving into the hours, which is the... Um, the pieces that uh, are actually available for sale, right? All of these pieces are available for sale. And there's actually one piece that's shown here in process. And maybe you can show us the final uh, result because when we went to your studio, it wasn't complete yet. Um, so we're really looking forward to watching this series grow. It's it's incredibly gorgeous and meaningful. And I love all of the the you know subconscious sort of uh, you know messaging happening. Um, so talk to us about this piece here. This is uh, two two fifty hours, I believe. Yes. Uh, so finally, I stopped dancing salsa, and I had to take a job along with my painting activity because I needed some income uh, apart from my painting sales, and um, I became a medical interpreter. And that was another connection with the Latino community because I had to translate between these uh, limited proficiency English patients and, and doctors. Um, and I heard a lot of their stories. Uh, they were gorgeous people. They were so grateful that I was helping them. And then I learned that some of them, uh, when they, we told them you need to take off for a couple of days to overcome your injury, they would say, oh, I am unable. And they explained to me, some of them, they're not allowed by their supervisors to take sick leave, even though it appears in their contract, or they are afraid to, add, to ask their supervisors because they are afraid they'll be fired and they need the money to pay for the rent and basic livings. And some of them told me the amount of sick leave hours that they had um, accumulated through their lifetime. So, Based on these, the, the Oceanside Museum of Art also uh, is um, accepted um, a proposal that this uh, group of women called uh, TWA uh, presented, talking about now. Now is the, the title of the show is curated by Alessandra Moctezuma, and it had to show um, the show is about our present political, so social and political present right now, our moment, how we are living it. So I decided to create this series and present it. For me, these foreign workers are essential. Uh, they are the basis of the um, uh, California economy, definitely. They do all the basic essential jobs. They are still doing it through the pandemic and, um, and they accumulate these hours. And, and they, they are personally beautiful. I, I, I just, 99.9% .9 of them are gorgeous people. So um, I decided to, I found models. I cannot disclose the name by, by HIPAA compliance. Um, I cannot display, uh, uh, disclose the name of patients, uh, but I can talk in general about this issue. So these, these models uh, embody my feeling for, for the migrant workers. And instead of the clouds, I'm going to talk about the formal uh, issues. Um, I decided to add these flowers uh, with acrylics that I was working on through the earlier stage of the pandemic. And uh, part of the inspiration was how they arranged the flowers in their head. And originally it was going to be a few flowers, but then like Gabriel Garcia Marquez said one time, the Nobel laureate in, lit in literature, he said his books, he is the author of 100 Years of Solitude. He said his books would start very contained and then they would explode and become un 
unattainable. Like they would, they would control him. It's the same with me. The paintings are controlling me. It's like I can't stop painting flowers. And they became this big. Um, apart from oh, that, I, yes, I included uh, in this case a digital image of uh, fasteners or screws and. Um, and I also added um, some some other components with line, um, and and in some of them I added Japanese paper. So this is mixed media, and the final coat is usually with uh, oils, basically on the face. The face I wanted to be very realistic. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be constructed yeah, because very out different. Of respect, I wanted to give them a face because oftentimes we don't see them, they become invisible to us. And however, they are giving so, so much to our society. Uh, I know they are getting paid, but they are not getting paid that much and they are giving us a lot. So this is my homage to them. I want to I want to read that uh, that statement that I read earlier uh, again because we're you know here we are in in front of the hours one more time but there's a there's a, a portion of this that I just find so compelling which is um, you know the hours is my homage to our valuable foreign workers whom I believe are the silent base of the American economy what I love is you say they are the seeds the fasteners the wheels the gears of our society and by taking care of the basics they nurture it. And that to me is just so moving in today's, uh, you know, climate um, where, you know, immigration has taken on this sort of, con more than ever, it's always been controversial, but more than ever, it's taken on this very controversial um, space in society. I, I mean, I wonder what you feel is your responsibility to voice, to give voice to the people who don't feel like they have a voice. Absolutely, I, absolutely. I feel it is my responsibility and just as a cur curious note, um, I have lived in California for 30 years and I've been in the art scene for, for uh, actually 20 since the year 2000. And I was told uh, by some of my peers from the other side of the border in Mexico or, or some of the Latino painters and uh, artists in this community that I should be more concerned in what I paint uh, with uh, border issues, but not up to, up to this point, I had a personal, even though I am an immigrant myself, I didn't have a personal uh, experience uh, as palpable as I am having now with them. And, uh, and also now the climate is the worst ever. So this is a confluence of events and it, it was just festering there and finally it happened. Uh, I actually I get goosebumps talking about this. Yeah, so I'm really, I, this is. I'm, I I wanted you mentioned your immigrant experience. I, I wonder, have you had um, you know, memorable experiences uh, yourself as an immigrant? I mean, you you are from Spain, which being European and Mediterranean, you know, clearly um, people may give you a little. Well, we'll say anyone who has racist tendencies might give you a little bit more grace potentially. Um, but possibly not someone from, you know, uh, North America or Central or South America, um, for whatever reasons they have envisioned and, you know, made up in their own heads. But, um, you know, you have an accent. Does that, has that, uh, have you felt a, sort of an immigrant, a pushback as an immigrant in your experience here in the last 20 years? Yes, in my case, it's extremely subtle because, as you said, I am a European looking and uh, I came here with a bachelor's degree in a plane. So um, most of the time it's been a great experience, but there's been moments, but as I said, in my case, it's very subtle and I need to tell you I'm such a stupid. Most of the time I don't even notice. Maybe later on I realize, oh, but my experience is actually very positive. And that is why I still, after losing my husband, live in uh, North America. Uh, but California is such a cosmopolitan place. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, a great uh, it's a great state for these migrants to come to, actually. It's one of the more progressive and um, with, with, a, with a Latino background, the names of the streets, the names of locations, so it's, I, I live in a, let's say, in a paradise compared with some of the red states in the center or south of the surely. country. Surely. Um, so what I love about this series, and we'll, we'll, we'll show another one of the pieces here. What I love about the series is that you've been able to find 
so much beauty in a subject can, that can be very uncomfortable and painful to talk about sometimes. Um, I wonder if you can share your reasonings. Maybe it was conscious, a conscious choice, or it was a subconscious choice. But what were your reasonings for um, illuminating this story in such a sort of aesthetically beautiful way? Yes, because the time to be angry, not that I am not, believe me. I mean, but the time to be angry has passed for me because I learned through my experience that that doesn't help you, um, especially in this society um, uh, where everybody is contained. Uh, so in reality, they are beautiful because it is my how I envision them. Is this how I see them? And I can see them better than most people because I speak Spanish. You know, I'm, their, I'm, I'm a sister to them. So for me, it's really easy to see how they are. I speak their language. They are fun loving, music loving people, most of them. They are family loving people, religion loving people without excess. Um, and if, of course there are bad apples in the barrel. And there are people that commit crimes. Yes, absolutely. And also they don't have the same uh, access to, they have plenty of access to benefits because I see that. But, you know, they are immigrants. We, we have to struggle to, to really move along when you are an immigrant. Um, so it's so beautiful because it is the way I see them and the way they are actually. They're beautiful people. Yes. 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 And there is nothing to fear about them. There is nothing to fear about them. They're beautiful people. I think most of the racism is based on fear. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so now that you've started touching this subject a little more directly, um, you know, the immigrant experience, do you feel like this has opened up a, a whole new path for you? Do you feel like you're gonna continue this conversation for a, a good while? Or are there other things that you're thinking about right now that you, that you are, are in line to be addressed in your art? In your I think I'm going to continue. Uh, these, these paintings are very involved, especially when I do the faces and I'm now uh, part, part of the time busy making my living. So I don't think I can make uh, Castilian paintings in the next three months, but I am definitely going to continue. It's been uh, accepted incredibly well by the public in general. Um, you know, I. I have to confess, I first thought, you know, I may not have any, any interest. May, people will, will not want to hear, to, to look at these native uh, indigenous people, uh, but I'm, I'm like a, an animal with it. Seriously, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I keep sketching in my, I sketch with my computer. I change colors, you know, with computer programs. And, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely not going to stop doing this. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have a, I have a two, two young children, one of them, uh, a boy and a girl. <clears throat> and my daughter is, um, you know, just like Mexicanos, Mexicans, you know, we are all shapes and colors and flavors and everything. And so some of our children are a little more European looking. My son was uh, born as a redhead. <laughs> somehow that happened and then my daughter is uh what we like to call toasty brown and she's re really proud of that and and um you know i i have family that ha touches every single sort of shade of the beautiful brown rainbow that we are um and so the these paintings i love how for example this one sort of um to me feels a little bit sort of like there's Asian connotations or something. You know, we do have a, an Asian population in Mexico, obviously. Yes. Um, so it, it makes me think about that. And then you have the, the sort of beautiful brown face of the woman behind you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the, the variety of the women that you are um, showcasing here from the more European looking to the Asians to the um, you know, the, the beautiful sort of indigenous uh, color of the earth. Um, I'm really enjoying that. Yes, and I'm going to paint men too, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to paint some men too, not to forget. I have a tendency to adore the women, but I'm going to paint men for sure, yes. Yeah, it's, they're, it's, it's an important story. And, you know, the, the, you know, the hands of the the, uh, the the hands of these fasteners and seeds and nurturers um, sort of interest me personally. Um, so I want to um, 
sort of ask you about the stories. Uh, I know you can't share too much information, but um, what has been, if you can share like one or two of the sort of most moving things that you've experienced in this um, job that you have and, and how it has informed your work? One story, um, I am afraid to disclose too much because I shouldn't, but um, I guess if I don't say the what, name- it's You don't have be... to share uh, specific details. I mean, you can maybe change a few of the details um, to uh, make it, un <laughs> you know, uh, as long as you're not giving uh, specific details that will be obvious to anyone listening, you know. One story that, that was very moving to me is a patient that, that was completely indigenous looking because we get the a range. I get more European looking uh, immigrant workers and, and more indigenous. She was very short of course uh, indigenous so she wasn't she was even shorter than me because <laughs> i'm very short and um, she was in her 60s maybe and she had her meniscus broken she told me she had worked for this company for years and years maybe her a lifetime and in this case it was positive they were uh, definitely providing care for her um, through workers compensation and she ended up being um, having surgery of that meniscus, but she had tears coming to her eyes so easily. And one time that she, I saw her several times, you know, we did follow-ups and one day, one day I had a be beautiful Indian pendant, Indian from like uh, Sedona, I think it was, Indian, Jew, you know, Indian Native American jewelry that yes. depicted an Indian person jumping in, in semi-precious stones. And as soon as she saw that, she broke in tears. And then she would thank everybody so profusely. Uh, so that was one. I have her name in my head, but I'm not going to. Uh, and I followed up. I wanted to make sure she got her surgery and this fantastic uh, North American tall blonde doctor did an operation on her and she, she, she overcame it. But the most um, interesting case was a lady that um, she only tripped on the street uh, near where she worked and uh, she broke a little bit of her, her lip and, and he just, she just had a sprain, but that was the lady that we said, you need to take two days off. And she said, no, I had 625 hours. She told me very proud that she was working for this employer, by the way, she was proud of the employer she was working for, but she told me her immediate uh, supervisor would not like her to take time off. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I asked her immediate supervisor was not Anglo. It was also um, uh, Mexican. So it's not always uh, white sure. versus brown. Sometimes they do it to themselves. Sure. And that right. is that is what took me aback. And I told the doctor, I said, doctor, doesn't he she have benefits? And, she, and the doctor said, a very, very kind doctor. He said, um, Yes, the benefits are not there for everyone. That was the answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the benefits are not there for everyone. So I was taken aback by that. Yeah. That was the detonant for me. Then as for that, I was looking for models. I thought I need to, I thought of the hours, you know, creating a series called the hours. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was very moving. I, I was holding back tears, tears a little bit thinking about that. And, and that happens so much. It's, it's really, um, it's really sad because it could be that their supervisor directly told them, but it's also probably their own perception of what they are allowed and not allowed yes, to do. Some of them are very shy and they are terrified of look, losing their job. They know they can be replaced right away by someone else. And they leave, especially the, in the pandemic environment. I mean, especially now, especially. having a job is, you know, so precious. <laughs> um, so I can see that that fear can only be elevated. Um, do you see yourself reflected in any of these in any way? I mean, how do you um, are you connected to these as a personally? Like, is this is any piece of this you? No, uh, as much as it is an expression of my feeling for them but no there is nothing uh it, this is the first time it's not biographical it's something mm. from outside myself but this is my appreciation for them how i feel for them 
Yes. That's beautiful. If you could show this to them, what would you like them to take away from these pieces? The beauty that you're talking about, I have to tell you, one of my patients was a painter, a very good uh, artist that was from Mexico that had to take a job. And he was in his uh, late 60s already. And I told him I was doing this series. And he actually had, his name was completely not Spanish. It was a native um, name. And I told him, gentleman, wonderfully looking, nice man. And I showed him in my phone these paintings that were in process. And he, he only looked at me with wide eyes and said, post it in Facebook. <laughs> he was very grateful. He said, please post it in Facebook. Aww, yes. Beautiful. So I, I would love they see they see them. Also, let me tell you, some of the co-workers, uh, you know, uh, there was, I was an, in an on-site clinic for a while. And most of the medical assistants were also Latinas and they work very hard and they were lovely people. And I would love they see that too. They see this too. Yes. Yeah. So let's get to the third piece, which is behind you. And I'm going to um, stop share for just a second so that you can, so we can see it. Can you talk to us about the piece behind you? The piece behind me um, is, um, the fourth one uh, of this series. And I realized I was uh, using uh, more towards European looking Mexican ladies. Mm -hmm. And I needed to bring the indigenous people to I want I didn't want to leave them behind because they are as much part of this as anyone else. So this is my first one. And I have sketched one of a mom, uh, actually a couple of indigenous ladies with the babies um, and we can get into another conversation with the babies and i'm going to show that in my paintings how they separate the babies from them yeah that has been the most heartbreaking story of the entire you know presidency um i i don't i don't know how to come to terms with that conversation you know Yes, that's, that's when I want to cry. You know, that's the moment yes. when I when I get upset. Yeah. Um, so talk to us about the artistic process. I know that you have um, uh, you have you, you first sketch it out. Right. I mean, do you yeah. do you plot it out? Is this something that you uh, you never just start painting? Right. I mean, this is this no. is something that you you think through how it's going to lay out. And so talk to us about that. Well, work from a photograph. Uh, that is allowed or given to me the rights for it. Um, and then I start modifying the photograph, uh, changing backgrounds, uh, adding colors. Uh, maybe I flip the photograph. I don't change the, I don't, I don't know Photoshop, by the way. I use a very rudimentary program called ACDC that allows me to, to do those changes of the background or block background. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I do different, different thumbnails or I call, you know, originally it was called a sketches or bocetos in Spanish, you know, and I choose the colors and the composition that I like the best. Uh, I imagine a lot of it is like where I place the flowers is in my mind. Um, so once I do that, I transfer the image, the, the figure. I transfer the figure into the canvas with um, carboncillo, with uh, charcoal, mm -hmm. and then I fix it. And I get uh, to start painting with my first coat in acrylics. I do the background. I try to uh, cover most of the painting that, that you know, you, it's, it's basic paint, painting. You try to eliminate any white that is left in the canvas. Um, and then I continue with acrylics and it's when I lay out the flowers with fluid acrylics. It's called pouring. You, pour, you, you work horizontal, you put it on a table, not on an easel. Mm -hmm. And then it, these are fluid acrylics that intermix with each other. And it's a whole technique that took me three months to actually get a hold of it, you know? Mm. And so I do the pre preliminary flowers and then I look at it once they dry and I add more flowers or take less. In some of the paintings that you've seen, I kept adding flowers through the weeks. <laughs> until it became almost overwhelming. Until so it exploded. Yes, it exploded. <laughs> and um, 
when I'm happy with the acrylic part of the composition, or I add, sorry, or I at this point I add paper, or I do a digital transfer, uh, which Robert Reichenberg used to do. It's called mm -hmm. um, in his combines. It's, it's just um, a copy or a, a printed paper image that you uh, put in reverse with some uh, acrylic medium, and then you let it dry, and the next morning you you take the the paper away with water and it leaves the image imprinted in your painting. Um, and then when I'm satisfied more or less with how it is going, I start working on the face. First, I give the first coat of on acrylic and then I go with oils because the my main media is oil and I love it. I love the, the, I love the way it mixes and spreads and I do the faces in, uh, in oil and I, I go, about four sessions, you know, I let it dry for, I do one session, let it dry. I go another session, I let it dry up to four sessions so that it is the most realistic possible. The lady behind me has had only two sessions or two and a half because this morning I tried a little bit and I still have to keep it, it's not finished. I, I want to work more on the face and the hat is not finished. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the process. Oh, it's I, it's so multi-layered. I love that there's texture involved. I know that you use with Japanese paper sometimes, often. Um, so I, I'm I'm um, that's what I what I love about your pieces is that there's there's this little like spark of life that just lives in there. Um, yes, so and I'm still adding glimmers sometimes because it's also part of my vocabulary. For me, yeah. they are the hope. You know, they they bring hope. They bring they they bring presence to us. When they come, uh, they not only take, um, and so I, I will continue painting hope and glimmers. Yes. Uh, is this is there a story behind the woman behind you? No, no, there is no particular story. I just is the story I told you of the woman with the meniscus. I would actually mm -hmm. call her name, but I don't want. No, do not. I don't. Want, I cannot, <laughs> don't by the that. law, disclose her name. Yes. Um, you've talked about your work, uh, and, and just one quick question, and then we'll move on to, if you have questions, please add them in the chat. This would be a good time to do that. And also on our Facebook live feed, our, uh, our intern, Abby, will be picking up those questions for us and dropping them in our chat so that I can access them. So um, this would be a good opportunity to start dropping your questions or your comments. Um, but um, you talked about your work they're having a bilingual component to it um, and possibly not in the hours. I, I mean, I, I can see that yes happening in the hours, but talk to me about the sort of bilingualism in your work. What does that mean? Um, it's easier if they see um, uh, one of my uh, Glimmer paintings. Mm -hmm. That's where I say I am bilingual. Uh, let me- I can, me I can, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, this is my Glimmer series. As you can see, the painting has two sections. The upper part is clouds with light coming through them. And the lower part is the light spectrum or my interpretation of the rainbow. So these are two different uh, styles in, in painting. The upper one is a realistic painting like Turner, you know, the painter mm -hmm. Turner mm -hmm. yes. uh, paintings, uh, in more like Euro European style and the lower part is contemporary um, uh, geometric uh, abstraction. Uh, it also connects with the light and space of Southern California in the 70s. Uh, artists in California were the painters, especially. They were focusing on light. Uh, it was their uh, version of minimalism as counterpart to the the one in New York, we, with was which was more with um, industrial um, elements, and here they were painting this. It's a big movement in Southern California. It's totally um, iconic here. Yes. So to me, the upper part is my European background, uh, and the lower part is my new me in California. And <laughs> so to me is. Spanish, English, you know, it's bilingual. I call it bilingual because it is by stylistic. Yes. So it reflects who I am because I am both. I am like a mutation of a European American. I am a European American. That is so the Californian experience though too, isn't it? You know, yes. to have these multi cultures and being able to embrace all the different cultures. Um, and 
another component that you've mentioned is the, the, the concept of a, having a mystical consciousness as an artist. Um, and that, that sort of fascinates me because I tend to be a very, I'm a very empathetic person and I'm very in tune with the subtext of things happening around me. You know, I feel, um, I'm not sure if that's sort of where you were leading with that, but it's, it's something that I pay attention to it, and I find that artists um, sort of have their spirit lives in this other universe where they're following not just what they see but what they feel in every situation are you like that of course yes definitely um for me art art towards a transformation i am a late bloomer i found it later on but i also had i always had it in me i just didn't learn to connect with that that part i was too busy surviving life hmm. um and making making something of myself that would support me professionally. And then when I embraced the art, when I was able to really focus on my artistic part, it was a liberation. And for me, inspiration is, um, that, that is inspiration. Um, it's, it's a mystical experience when you, when you reach a point of inspiration. So I was actually very literal when I was painting these clouds I was painting my inspiration, the transformation that art produces within me. So I have a very romantic soul. It's very typical of my culture. Uh, but that is what um, uh, mysticism means to me. It's that moment of inspiration that makes you so exalted. And there's Not always is able to connect with that, I guess, but there's are, always a uh, components of, for sure. I am. I mean, that's uh, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I sort of live in another uh, world peopled by ideas, you know, um, there, um, there's always seems to be a component of nature also in your work. And I'm interested, did you grow up always around nature? Is that a big part of your life or how did that become such an important part of your work? but I'll tell you, that's a great question. Um, I grew up in the center of Madrid. It was hard to find, uh, you know, my, they would take me to parks so that I could see a tree. However, my parents come from, they emigrated to the city when they were teenagers and made a life in the city, but they come from rural, from the a rural em environment in the Northwest of Spain. It's an area called uh, Sanabria that is very close to Galicia. It's very uh, much like Ireland, very uh, green. Mm. And I spent all my summers there about three months and it was such a contrast with the city to go there. I have the greatest memory of my summer. So I think maybe that is one of the reasons. Also, I decided to study biology. I was always interested in biomedicine and biology. So that is also part of who I am. Does the bio the, does the does biology play into your work in some ways? I mean, the the sort of molecular. Are you a molecular biologist? Or? I am actually a molecular biologist, uh -huh. although I took uh, one year of uh, zoology. Uh, by the uh -huh. way, some of the friends from Spain are are classmates from my biology school in Spain, and they are still connected to me. Oh wow! Well, <laughs> I and love that. You, you talk about being uh, introduced to art early on, even though you uh, sort of were a late bloomer in your practice. But uh, what does that mean? Just because M Madrid is such a culturally vibrant uh, city, where you can go to museums and uh, uh, and Sofia, um, Museo Sofia, Sofia. Sofia. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can go to all these. Things. Is it is that the exposure that you're talking about? Definitely, um, Spain, like uh, a lot of the Latin American countries, in, especially Mexico, is very uh, art oriented. The society as a whole is very art oriented. The Spaniards don't buy as many, as much art as the Mexicans do, by the way. Mm -hmm. But we, you need to be culture. It's, it's part, or you got, you got get a stigma. So I grew up with that, um, also very close to the being in Central Madrid, I was very close to all the museums. So I, I learned, we, in my country, people revere, they have a reverence for artists, actually. Not like here, you know, here, right. oh, you're an artist, whatever. Yeah. But in my country, people have a reverence for artists. I think it's the same in Mexico too. Yes, it's definitely um, in Mexico. I, yes. I, I grew up, um, 
So I was born in Tijuana and I was raised between the border, San Diego, Tijuana and Mexico City. So I was always in those massive museums and, uh, you know, surrounded by incredible music and art and culture and all of that. It's a, such an incredible powerhouse kind of city like Madrid. I mean, Madrid is, I love Madrid. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you definitely get the sense of awe you know, the sense of awe being in front of these incredible works of art. I think the United States has that in some, in the most culturally vibrant places of Absolutely. the United States, of course, but San Diego, um, it's got a little ways to go when it comes to uh, the respect uh, given to artists that they definitely deserve. Um, because especially now in times of crisis that we've all been dealing with so many from everything from you know COVID to the social justice issues to you know the um, challenge to democracy, we we seek art to heal us. You know that's that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a movie to take us away from it all, a a, a song, a, a work of art, um, you know, to practice the, the the craft of art ourselves to sort of express what's what's in our hearts. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, artists are doing really important work right now. Let's not forget that. Um, this is our last opportunity for questions. If you have any, um, please put them in the chat or if you have uh, comments, I mean, you've got some wonderful comments uh, happening here that they're loving, um, you know, that your definition of mysticism and um, let's see. Hello to all the Spaniards. <laughs> Hola, hola. Saludos. Pueden hacer sus preguntas en español también, si quieren. Adelante. Um, and yes, indeed, art is essential for our well-being. Um, so we just have like four minutes left um, of our talk. And I'd like to share with you um, that, of course, these works are available for sale. So I'm going to share this with you. This is our art shop. Um, this is Julia's page. It's called The Hours. And we will add the fourth piece uh, in here once it's available for us to photograph. Um, but you can come here to um, vanguardculture.org and then you'll see the art shop. Um, you can sort of hover over it to look in the detail or you can hit this little magnifying glass and uh, see the piece as a whole. Okay. And if you like one of the pieces, you can just select them and it'll populate here and it'll populate here. And this is the uh, price of these pieces shown. 25% of uh, the sale goes back to Vanguard Culture. Uh, and you know we are a nonprofit that works to advance the creative industry workforce. We are an all volunteer organization. All of this was done through a volunteer team. And so you know our, our mission in with the art shop is to bring attention to artists that are dealing with contemporary issues that are whose work is addressing um, you know social social issues. So uh, it's certainly uh, you know a pleasure that I got to highlight your work in this, Julia. Um, do you have any message that you'd like to leave us with today um, uh, related to your work or related to art in general? My message is uh, the last thing you mentioned. Uh, art is very important in our days. Don't underestimate it. Give yourself that treat. I'm not saying that you buy it, but at least that you look at it and that you listen to music because it, it completely changes your heart and we need that more than ever. So don't underestimate the value of art. That is my message. That's beautiful. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, the paintings are very big, the, the ones that um, are depicted here, but the last piece is smaller and the prices will go along with the size, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that said, um, this is the end of our event for today. A huge thank you to our featured artist Julia San Roman for your time and your creative brilliance. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Susana. Thank you to you. You are brilliant too. You're wonderful. Thank you. And as a reminder, uh, the works, uh, the hours, as we just mentioned, are available for purchase. Um, they are ready to hang and they include free delivery for San Diego residents. And again, 25% of that sale comes back to Vanguard Culture 
uh, which is an organization that works to advance the creative industries. So if you have the means to do so, or you know someone who is an art collector that would appreciate this work, please share that with them. Now is the time to purchase art by original artists. And that is a great way to support the arts by putting uh, money in the pocketbooks of the artists who are bringing joy to your life. And that goes with everything, with visual and performing arts. So if there's an arts organization that has brought you joy this year, please consider making a tax deductible donation to them. Um, if you are, know a local artist whose work you've always appreciated, this is the time to buy their artwork, uh, shop local, you know, all of those good things because, um, you know, large corporations and, you know, Amazon doesn't need any more money. It's the, the people that you know and love who actually need that support. So we appreciate that. You may follow Vanguard Culture on social media at Vanguard Culture at Culturally Savvy or visit VanguardCulture.org to be a part of our season. Thank you again for supporting the arts. We'll see you at the next Art Shop Talk.